So a microphone is a transducer. And what that means is that it's going to change one form of energy into another. And with a microphone, we're specifically using it to change sound waves into an electrical signal. So we can transmit it over that XLR cable and send it to wherever it needs to go next. And a microphone does that by using a diaphragm to detect the volume of a sound wave. And now our diaphragm actually is, it's not quite like the diaphragm that we have in our body, which is what's pushing our lungs up and down. But what it is, is a very sh uh, thin sheet of uh, material, which it depends on the type of microphone, what this is made out of. And it's um, because it's so thin, when a sound wave passes through it, it can actually move that diaphragm or the diaphragm is going to vibrate with the sound that's passing through it, which is exactly how you're hearing my voice right now. I'm actually talking into a dy dynamic mic, um, and I'm about a few inches away from the edge of the microphone, and just beyond the edge of the microphone is where that diaphragm is. And as my voice is passing through the diaphragm, it's moving that diaphragm. And in a few slides, we'll actually see how this, um, di this um, dynamic mic is actually transmitting my voice in. Um, but when we're talking about microphones, uh, we're, we're, when we talk about volume, we're also going to be measuring it in what's called sound pressure level. And that goes back to our first day where we talked about how sound transmits through a medium. And when we're going through air, um, sound is going to manifest itself as, you know, energy that's being transferred through air molecules, which is going to change, um, discreetly change sound pressure level um, in the air. And there are three types of microphones. We have dynamic, condenser, and ribbon. A dynamic microphone is going to use electromagnetic induction to create the electrical signal so it can pass through. And it does that through a diaphragm, which looks like this. Um, you have the, um, ma the diaphragm material kind of at the very top. Um, and then underneath you have a voice coil and a magnet. And so the coil and the diaphragm are actually connected to one another uh, and can move independently of the magnet while the magnet is actually going to stay still uh, and remain there the whole time fixed in one position. And the way that a dynamic microphone is going to pick up sound and transmit it and then thus change it into an electrical signal is as the sound wave or as the sound pressure level moves through the diaphragm, it's going to move that diaphragm and the coil because they're connected to one another. And that coil is hovering over the magnet, as you can see here. And as the coil moves over the magnet, a very, very small electrical signal is generated because the magnet and the coil have a different charge. And that very small electrical charge is then transmitted uh, through the other end of the microphone out into your XLR cable and to whatever comes next. These microphones are great for speech, as you can hear right now. Um, they're also very good for loud instruments, such as brass instruments or saxophone. Um, sometimes they're good for vocals, not necessarily in a studio setting. You're, you're going to have better options when you're in a, uh, uh, what I would call a controlled sound environment, like a recording studio or a production studio, um, as well as other loud source situations. And if you notice, I'm saying there's a lot of loud situations, and that is because these are not great at picking up small details and high frequencies because that coil needs more sound energy to move itself because there's nothing giving it power. Just the raw power of my voice right now is what's moving that um, coil back and forth. Um, and so if you have a very soft uh, instrument, something like uh, maybe one violin, you would have to turn up the gain on this microphone very high in order to pick it up, or you'd have to put the microphone very close to the violin itself. Um, there are some benefits, though. It does not require any additional power, um, which means that you can just plug this in and record or send signal into any other device via XLR. Very rarely TRS for a microphone. It's almost always XLR. Um, and then another great thing is these are durable and affordable. Uh, in the, the video from the previous slide, if you guys go and watch it, you'll see there's actually someone nailing in a piece of foam with one of these while it's on and active. Um, and he picks it back up and he talks back into it and says, hey, still sounds good. 
and that is because there's there's really no moving parts other than the diaphragm and the coil um, and they're shielded by a cage so you can you know knock it on the ground it, you can drop it and pick it up and it works pretty much fine um, if you've seen uh, people do like the mic drops they usually do it with a dynamic mic thankfully because it's kind of the only mic that you can drop and pick up and nothing will break um, but that doesn't mean that you should um, these are relatively affordable microphones. This Shure PG57 I'm on is probably around $50. The Shure SM57 is kind of your standard dynamic mic, and it's about the same price. You can find them cheaper than that if you want. You can also find them much more expensive and more specialized as well. Um, but that's a, a lot of the reasons why they're going to be used in live sound is because they're pretty cheap they're pretty durable so you can have a uh, one night you can have a screamo band with the vocalist having the microphone you know back by the the end of their their throat screaming into it and then you can you know find a lysol wipe if you can get it and wipe down the mic and then the next night someone else can use it and it's not going to really have any issues um, and this is an sm58 uh, the SM57 that I mentioned earlier has a little bit of a different cage, but this is very similar to the one that I'm using right now. The other um, main type of microphone you will find out there is the condenser microphone. Um, these are what's called electrostatic. Um, and what you have is uh, a capacitor that is made up of two plates. And this is the capacitor right here. You have a front plate, which is your diaphragm, which is what's going to vibrate as the sound passes through. And then you have this back plate. Um, and both of these are receiving DC power uh, to create a very narrow electrical field between these two plates. Um, and as the sound passes through and as that diaphragm vibrates picking up that sound, it electrifies that vibration and it gets captured by both of these plates and then sent out to um, whatever comes next. The benefit to this is there's no magnet. Um, and this is another way to look at a dynamic microphone, or a uh, condenser microphone. And these have two types of diaphragms. You have a large diaphragm, which I'll talk about a little bit more on the next slide right here. The front of your microphone, when you have a large diaphragm, microphone is actually here, it's side addressed. Um, whereas with a small diaphragm, um, condenser microphone, your quote unquote front of your microphone is actually the top, just like a, uh, a dynamic mic or what you might call a, a speech mic. Now, I mentioned that there was power being sent to the uh, microphone for this, and this power is called phantom power. It is often going to be marked as plus 48V on mixers or on interfaces. And before we had phantom power, we actually had batteries inside these microphones. And when a condenser microphone was first developed, it was actually not very popular because these batteries would die and they were very expensive or impossible to replace. And so you were buying a microphone that had a determined lifespan. And when you're investing in a microphone uh, that can be as expensive as these can, you're not wanting to have to replace a battery. You're not wanting to have to get a new one in five years because the battery dies. So by having... Um, phantom power being able to be sent over the microphone cable it made these microphones a lot more viable for studios and thus it actually helped increase the quality of recordings as well um, however when you have expensive condenser mics which they can get up to thousands of dollars you will want to have an external preamp uh, to use with these more expensive models it's kind of like getting you, you don't want to get like a three thousand dollar microphone and then plug it into a mixer that's been living in the back of your trunk through all the winters and summers for the past four years because you're not actually going to hear the best sound that you can through that. You want to make sure that it's getting good enough power and then you probably want to get rid of that mixer if you actually do have one in your trunk. Um, but the benefit to a, conden a condenser microphone is that they are more sensitive to uh, volume from the source, much more capable of capturing extreme subtleties in sound, such as higher frequencies. However, they are much more sensitive to um, sound pressure levels. So after about 95 decibels, they will start to distort. So oftentimes, um, condenser microphones might be a little bit further away from the source. Um, whereas dynamic microphones, like I said, you can put it right in up in front of you and they'll still work up until you know a certain point and then they may start to distort that. 
at that point. But for the most part, condenser microphones are going to give you better quality sound, especially for softer or more delicate sound sources. Um, and like I said in the last slide, they come in two sizes. You have a large and small diaphragm. A large diaphragm is excellent for uh, more subtle vocals. However, you will want to add a pop filter uh, to filter out mouth noise. Now, I've been going back over these videos, and I have been noticing that there have been some uh, instances where you can hear uh, my un unintended kind of noises as I'm talking. Um, and this is going to happen a lot of times on my P's and S's. Um, and those are called uh, plosives. They're syllables that are going to generate a lot of concentrated air. Because if you think of um, the syllable for P, it generates a concentration of air going in one direction, basically going right into the microphone. And then S's, it's creating a lot of higher frequencies and it has kind of a focused um, uh, air path as well. And so microphones can pick those up very in very strange ways. Now I'm using a dynamic microphone, so it's not as, um, it's not gonna be as bad as it would be on a, unfiltered um, condenser microphone and I think actually next week I will speak into my condenser microphone without a pop filter um, to show you guys uh, what that sounds like versus this dynamic mic while we're also working in Pro Tools. Um, so if you add a pop filter what that will do is it will filter out a lot of those unwanted noise noises that we make when we talk and it's unintended. Um, I know you guys probably have listened to podcasts or maybe at some point the radio and you hear all these weird sounds that are coming out. Like if I were to say pea pod crisps, there's a lot of unintended noise at the end of that. Um, and that's just because of our language and our, our mouths. And so using a pop filter will help reduce that. Now, a small diaphragm is going to be even more sensitive to decibel levels than a large diaphragm and is capable of capturing the highest frequencies of condenser microphones. And these are going to be really good for piano and strings and other softer instruments, but not to be used for vocals. Um, and the reason why a smaller diaphragm is more sensitive is because it actually has a smaller surface area and can move um, when there's less sound pressure level coming through. Whereas if you have a larger diaphra diaphragm, it takes more energy to move it because there's more surface area. Kind of like if you're pushing a boulder up a hill, you probably want the smaller one instead of the bigger one because it takes less energy for you to push it or to move it. Uh, and so that concept is the same when it comes to condenser microphones. Um, these are very delicate though and they are going to be best in a, re a controlled sound environment, so like a recording studio. Um, however, that doesn't mean that it's only exclusive to a recording studio. Um, you will see them used in um, live sound on occasion. Uh, and the same goes for dynamic microphones. Um, in the studio at JCCC down on the first floor, we have very nice um, dynamic mics that we use in the studio as well. And we use these um, sh um, Shure SM57s or PG57s as well because they're just, they're good microphones. But um, typically condenser mics will be preferred to be used in a controlled sound environment like your recording studio. And like you can see at the bottom, they can range in price significantly. Uh, they can cost $10,000. They can also cost $100. Um, so there's quite a range in um, cost when it comes to getting this kind of microphone. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about preamps with you guys real quick. Um, I mentioned that in the previous slide that sometimes these are referred to as pre's. Um, and these amplify the incoming sound from your microphone to a more usable level. And this is especially helpful if you're using like a dynamic microphone, but your source isn't very loud and you don't have anything else on you. You plug this into a preamp and it's going to also up the, the, the volume, the, the gain of your sound that's coming in. And these are also what are going to supply your phantom power for condenser microphones. And these are found on most mixers and audio interfaces. Um, when we talk about ribbon mics on the next slide, you will never use phantom power with ribbon mics. Um, when you get the more expensive condenser mics, you're going to want to use a preamp. Um, they're going to give you better sound quality thanks to better electrical shielding inside the preamp itself. 
uh, if you want to get a standalone one. And the result is going to be a cleaner sound with less uh, hiss or fuzz. Now, ribbon mics are similar to the dynamic microphones in that they both use magnets, unlike our condenser microphone. Um, and a ribbon mic is going to have a thin, corrugated aluminum ribbon, just like the name suggests, as its diaphragm. Uh, and this is going to be placed between magnets that create a magnetic field around it, like this. Um, so here you have the ribbon, which is actually what's detecting that sound as it's passing through. And then surrounding that ribbon is this electromagnetic field generated by this circular magnet. And then the sound is being transmitted from the ribbon through these into uh, through these cables out through the microphone. Never use phantom power with ribbon mics. That is because this ribbon is very, very delicate, very thin, and was perfectly engineered to do one purpose, which was to pick up sound without power being added to it. And if you add power to it, what you can do is you can actually fry the very delicate uh, wires that are connected to the ribbon. You can actually break the ribbon. You can um, tear it apart if you have too much power going through it. It's, it's really dangerous to use a um, phantom power with a ribbon mic. So the best practice is if you're using different type of microphones, always keep your phantom power off. And then you can turn it on at any time when you need it with the condenser microphone um, and then turn it off once you're done. Now, dynamic microphones, you actually don't have to worry so much about phantom power with them. It's not going to help them, but it won't hurt them. Another reason why they're so rugged and so um, friendly for live sound, because someone could accidentally turn on phantom power for the entire mixer, and all the dynamic microphones are just going to work like normal. Now, going back to ribbon mics, um, these were kind of your older style of microphones. Um, but they fell out of favor once um, once condenser microphones got phantom power um, because they weren't as delicate as ribbon mics. Um, but thanks to uh, advances in the technology to build the ribbons, um, they've become a little bit more common and a little bit more favorable to certain sound situations. Um, these mics are going to have some of the best uh, detection to low decibel or low sound pressure level sounds. And they're characterized as, as characterized as having a warm sound um, and work great with, again, those very quiet acoustic instruments such as guitar, acoustic guitar, uh, strings, and piano. Um, they can be pretty great for vocals, um, but they're going to be more sensitive to mouth noise. So if you don't have a pop filter, I would not really recommend using it with uh, a vocalist unless you have one. Um, but ribbon mics are used pretty often when it comes to... Um, like NPR, for instance, will have, uh, or radio stations will have ribbon mics um, or condenser mics. Sometimes if your podcaster is really invested in the quality of his, his or her voice, they may have a ribbon mic as well. Store it securely, though. Handle it carefully. Do not use phantom power with it again. It will destroy that ribbon. Um, and just like condenser mics, these can be very expensive. Uh, there's a company by the name of Royer that makes ribbon mics, and they are quite expensive. But if you're looking for a great microphone to use with like piano and strings, this is going to be a really good microphone to have for that. Now, a microphone can pick up sound in certain directions around it. Generally, you think it can pick up sound directly in front of it. However, that's not always the case. Um, and a polarity pattern is going to tell us where sound is going to be picked up by that microphone. There are three main types. However, these uh, types of patterns can change slightly. We have some variations on some of these patterns. Uh, and that we even have microphones that can change between these patterns as well. Uh, the three are cardioid, bidirectional, or also sometimes called a figure eight, and omnidirectional. So a cardioid is going to pick up what is in front of and to the side of the microphone. Uh, it is the most common pattern, if not the only one, in many dynamic microphones, as well as ribbon and condenser mics. And it's going to be used for um, some stereo pair miking situations, which you guys will learn about what these are um, in your Recording Studio One classes. This is a basic cardioid pattern. 
So we have the mic is starting here and it's picking up sound directly in front of and around to the side, but not behind it. And again, this is ideal for your kind of live sound situation where you want to control where your sound is coming from. And generally with a front facing mic like this, you want to have it facing its source. So it's facing me right now and it's not capturing the sound of my cat moving my computer and stuff on the desk around, which has been happening this whole time. Isn't that right, Oliver? Um, there are other variations on cardioid patterns, um, such as supercardioid and hypercardioid. And these are going to be slightly different. They still kind of have that like mushroom shape out in front, but they are capable of capturing some sound, some sound from behind the microphone. And they have a little bit of a narrower range to the side as well. So it's a little bit more focused in front and maybe you're getting a little bit behind. Um, so why might we want to capture sound from behind the microphone? Um, it depends on the situation. You maybe want to have less of an isolated sound that you're capturing. So if you're in a recording studio and you want to capture the sound of the vocalist, but you also want to make sure that when you're lining up your vocalist track that you're in time with the drummer and the drummer is in that room as well, you'll actually capture a little bit of the drums as well. And that can help you line them up together if that's something that you're looking to do. Um, you can also use this in a live sound situation where maybe you want to get a little bit of like that audience response uh, at a live concert um, when you're actually recording it. Maybe not feeding it back into the PA system or anything like that, but uh, live um, albums often have a lot of audience noise and response because you want to hear that, you know, a crowd of 15,000 people loved you when you sang that song. Who doesn't? And so these sound or these uh, microphones can capture some of the audience sound from that one microphone rather than having to have another one just to capture everyone getting all hyped up because you're singing that song. Bidirectional or figure eight is going to pick up what is directly in front of and behind the microphone. However, if you were to turn that microphone to the side 90 degrees, it's actually going to pick up everything to the left and the right. Um, just like the name suggests, it is two directions, and when it's going uh, in front and behind, that is going to be uh, a figure eight, hence the uh, nickname for it. It is seen in some condenser and ribbon microphones, um, and it is excellent for capturing the sound of a hall or of a room that someone is uh, in. And so if you're doing a recording in a large um, hall, it actually isn't a terrible idea to have a um, bi-directional mic if you want to get a little bit of that reverb from the space to kind of tell the listener hey this is what they're in and it kind of helps us feel like we're in the space with them um, <clears throat> the last one of course is omnidirectional which is going to capture sound 360 degrees around the microphone it is excellent to capture a room or hall because it's literally going to get everything around it's also likely captures the sound of audience in a live setting and when you're doing a uh, recording in a studio situation, if you want to have one mic that kind of, you might want to call it the room mic uh, because it literally captures the room. It's one way to um, kind of capture everyone more or less equally. And then if you have microphones on people close up, you can actually mix in those close mics with an omnidirectional uh, microphone recorded track as well. And this one, I'm not sure why they even made a diagram for it. It's a circle. It just captures everything around it equally. Um, and again, like the name suggests, it is omnidirectional, 360 degrees all the way around the microphone. And lastly, uh, there are microphone manufacturers that make different models that can actually change between various polarity patterns. And it makes this microphone much more versatile. And when you guys are first starting out, you may need to invest in something like this because each one of these polarity patterns can be good for certain things, but if you only have a handful of microphones, you may have to get creative um, with how you're recording an entire band, uh, especially when it comes to drums. Drums take about, you can maybe get away with five microphones if you're going, if it's a really, really small and really simple drum kit, but typically you need like eight or nine mics to record a drum set effectively. And so if you only have four mics, you can't and you can't use them all on the drums you're going to have to get pretty creative and so by having the ability to change between polarity patterns it gives you some flexibility for whatever walks in that door 
Uh, there are also sometimes some controls on microphones for high and or low frequency ranges. And what this will do is it will like make the microphone less or uh, less sensitive to low frequencies or less sensitive to the very high frequencies that we can hear. So between 20 and 20,000 hertz. And you can also change the input level. It's typically a switch going from zero to minus 10 decibels. Um, and so you can uh, tell this, the microphone to be less sensitive or um, at its normal range of sensitivity, and it will literally change the input going through by 10 decibels, depending on how you switch it. So guys, that is um, our last lecture for this week. Um, like I said at the beginning of the video, go through the slides that I have on Canvas just to kind of refresh yourselves. If I talked about something kind of fast and you didn't quite grasp it, you know, rewind this video um, and listen to me uh, talking about it again. If you are still unsure about something, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I am going to have open office hours this week. I, I may have to change the time from what I said last time, but I am going to send an email out telling you uh, what day and time I will be available for open office hours. And I may be able to make appointments outside of that if need be. But this week is more about you guys listening to me talking about this, going through these slides, going and seeing those links and those videos, um, and really starting to get yourself immersed in the world of audio. Because we've been living in MIDI um, and in Pro Tools, and now I want you guys to feel a little bit more knowledgeable about audio equipment in a studio, how a microphone works, and the different types out there. Um, so then that way, next week, when we get started on actually recording, you'll know a little bit about how this can be done in a recording studio, and we'll work on how to make it happen for you yourselves at home, regardless of whatever um, microphones or equipment you have available. So again, let me know if you have any questions. Go through everything on here. And, oh, I have... I do have some other resources, links on there about where to place microphones properly that may become a little bit more important next week, but I want you guys to have those as resources for yourselves because you're not always going to know where's the best place to put a microphone on every single instrument. And luckily for you, there are people who have already figured it out. And so if you're really interested in recording, I would recommend that you go to these websites, bookmark them put them somewhere in a folder on your web browser that says for later or for recording. So that way when someone walks in with a flute and you're like, holy crap, how do I do this? You can go to that website and you'll see how to record a flute properly. So I hope you all are well. I hope you're staying home, staying inside if you can. I um, hope you're also not going crazy staying home and inside. And um, again, reach out to me. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll... Uh, I'll be back the following week with another video. Thanks.